Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Who were the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared? Though he were a son, yet, he learn, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not strong, strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Last week we were... We went through this chapter again, but we were concentrating on chapter 4, uh, verses 14 through 16. And we saw how important doctrine was. I mean, our whole approach um, to God, uh, knowing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, who is son of God. We hold fast this profession and holding fast this Profession, we come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Looking at this high priest, Jesus, Son of God. Now, you know, we're, we're writing to the Hebrews and uh, this, this whole letter, uh, as we go through it, uh, is so important uh, even today, even though we're not Hebrews, uh, but we're in the church, so this letter has great importance for us. There, there's ex exhortations there, there's warnings uh, there, because, you know, I, I have spent the last few weeks looking, looking at the church, looking at the world, and I would have to say that the church is in a pretty, I don't know what kind of uh, pretty useless at the time. You, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I could I go back through history, I go back through scriptures, and I see she had gotten in that shape before, and men and women prayed, and, and, and God brought her back, you know, if you will. And, you know, I look around and I think, man, what, what is going on with the church? I don't care what's going on with the world. To me, what's going on with the church? Where's she at? She's so divided. She's so useless. I mean, we can't even get a bug bite healed. You know what I mean? And these things ought not be. Well, why is that? Well, we saw last week, you know, it begins with prayer. But how does prayer begin? Let us hold fast this profession. Uh, you know, going going through, and, and I, I think... Uh, you know, I, I, in, in my prayer, I was asking the Lord, well, what do we preach? You know, we talk about teaching and preaching and all of these other things. And there's, there's so much out there and there's so much that draws crowds. But really, what, what does the church need? You know, that, that was my prayer. What does the church need? What do we do? Well, he just takes me right to Moses and Israel in the wilderness and they're being bitten by snakes. What was the solution? 
hold up the brass serpent. I, I, and all that look on him, all that look on that brass serpent fashioned to a pole will be saved. Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's same, same message. Same message. People has got itchy ears. They want to hear, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. And, and somebody asked me the other day, uh, you know, about uh, certain teachings. And, and uh, you know, my only thought is this. Who, who is glorified here? Who has the preeminence? Is it you? Are you the center of the teaching? Or is it all about Jesus is doing something and we're preaching Jesus, but not really. It's about what he's doing for you. Or are we holding up the cross? It sounds so simple, doesn't it? It sounds so simple, but, you know, there it is. We preach Jesus and him crucified. That just, and I know all these other benefits that go with it. I know all of this stuff, but I'm not here to preach the benefits, but the man. And that's what we got to look at and, and, and the more that I see of the man, Christ Jesus, uh, you know, the, the more that it comes into the, to the wow factor. Uh, you know what I mean? In, into, the, into the awesomeness of it. I, I, you know, and I'm just talking here. I was looking at prayer. And one of the things that I saw, and, and we'll look at it a little bit today, uh, in our study last week, because I always go back over and I look at them and I rehash them and go again and and, and all of that. And, and you know, we we say that prayer is conversation with God. You know, talking to God. And that seems uh, a pretty you know uh, universal understanding. But one of the things that I've saw, if it's just conversation with God, why not just say, "Hey, go talk to God." But the word is, a, a distinct word is used. It's called prayer. And, and uh, when Jesus prayed, he didn't say, hey, I'm going to go talk to dad. Uh, it was different. And, and there's a reverence there. There's a respect uh, there. You know what I mean? Things that today have gone out. Uh, you know, I mean, you you even look how you were raised up with your parents, and I guarantee you there was honor and reverence and respect in the home. Today, it's uh, you know, it's 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 not, and and even with God, and we forget His uh, majesty and and His glory and His, I mean, who who this is, who this mighty stately king is so so prayer in itself is going to come with some reverence and i think we'll see that today as we go through this holding fast our profession let us come boldly to the throne of grace i mean he's talking to hebrews who knew you didn't dare go into that place i mean in behind that veil to these hebrews was the very presence of the living god they knew men who had intruded into that place before and had been killed. People offered wrong, strange fire. They had been killed. People come out with leprosy. You don't mess with This is serious business. We want to make it, you know, we, we want to dumb it down and make it more. But this, I mean, this is a holy God here, the living God. Uh, who said, let there be light, and there was light. And, and to me, instead of bringing God down, if you will, he brings us up. It's completely different. When I see his magnificence and holiness, and yet this one calls me uh, his son? Oh, you know, instead of just saying, hey, me and dad, we got our own thing going. I mean, this this mighty God has called us his son. He's called us righteous. Now, wait a minute. I, you know, like Paul, oh, uh, that means all the other stuff is done. I, I counted as I lost that I might know him, not having any righteousness of my own. And, and, and so I see that more and more and more. So as we come out of that last week, let us come boldly. How do we come boldly? Holding fast our profession, which you know, we looked at, we have a great high priest, not just a high priest. Aaron was never called the, 
the great high priest. He was just called the high priest. But now we have a great high priest passed into heavens. Who is he? Jesus, son of God. And then he goes on to explain this high priest here a little bit uh, to these Hebrews. And, 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 you know, now that we have studied and seen, we, we can understand what he's talking about. So it, he says, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant on them that are out of the way for that he himself also was compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. Now, what he's talking about here is God chose Aaron to be the high priest. He chose the, uh, Levi, and uh, Levi's sons was Moses and Aaron, and out of that he chose Aaron to be uh, the high priest. Aaron didn't wake up one day and says, hey, Moses, you know, I think today I'm going to try to help you out. Uh, we need a, a priest. So... God had made this calling. God had made this choice here. And by the time uh, this Hebrews is, was written, uh, they had, uh, Israel had fallen into such apostasy that uh, you could buy your way into the high priest office. They had multiple high priests, and it was more of a political office. You know, you, as long as you do what I want for a little while, you can be high priest. If not, we'll get you out and get another one in. It had nothing to do with genealogy, being a son of Aaron whatsoever. They, they had disregarded all of that. They disregarded it. But here he says that this high priest was a, was a man chosen by God to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And, and, you know, through this whole thing here, it's about our approach. I mean, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. It's about our approach to God. Man's a, approach to God was, was, we know, was through the high priest. You didn't, you couldn't go in there. When that high priest went in there, he carried Israel with him on his shoulders, on, a, on his breastplate. You had that mitre, holiness unto the Lord. And he went in carrying, representing the entire nation to bring them in before God. So the approach to God, the only approach there was to God was through this high priest. Now, He's telling the Hebrews here, every high priest taken from among men is ordained. He's uh, meaning, you know, the, the high priest you guys know was a man, Aaron. We can trace it. Gen he wasn't an angel because in Hebrews we had to deal with these angels all the way back there. And the reason he, he wasn't an angel is because so he could have compassion. I mean, he was a, a, a like man like they are with the, with the same... Uh, feelings of infirmity, if you will. And, and you know, we know we're going to be talking about Jesus, but right now he's telling about Aaron, but looking back at Jesus, it says, uh, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now this word here, ordained, that, that's the word appointed. If, if you will, ordain, it says for men. And I got to look at it. He's, yeah, I mean, you would think he's ordained from men, but he's ordained for men on, on, on man's behalf. So I got to ask the question, why in the world do we even need a priesthood anyway? Why did God establish a priesthood? Why did he establish a high priest? And, and, and kept it going. He didn't really do away with it. I'll show you here in a few minutes. Peter calls us a royal priesthood. And this high priest, this our Jesus Christ, our great high priest, endureth forever. So it's not something that, that goes away. He established it in this type and shadow here under Moses. And it still goes on, this order. I mean, this is the order that God ordained. 
So why why priest? Now we got to understand uh, this is we're talking. Our only approach to God is through this priest. So I mean, who is God? I mean, God is holy. God is just. God is righteous. God is love. But God is spirit. We're not spirit. We're people made of the dust of the earth. So he established this priesthood. And, and do you remember uh, in 1 Timothy 6 and 16, it says, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now think about that. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor, power, everlasting, amen. The first high priest, we may have mentioned this before, but or not high priest, but well, yeah, he was first high priest. The first high priest was Adam. Because there's no dwelling in the presence of God except you be a priest. So Adam was the first high priest. And where was he? He was in the garden in the presence of God. Made in, in God's image. You know, made, made in, in God's likeness. But we know Adam sinned, became one with the lie, so he's removed from the presence of God, and now there's no way back. And even in the tabernacle that was there, you guys know this, I'm just going over a little bit, these Hebrews would have known this. There was no way back, there was a wall, there was a, a petition there. God's on that side, and I'm on this side, just like when... Adam got turned out of the garden. A flaming sword and cherubims kept the way. And, and no man could approach under God anymore. I mean, that was it. It was, fellowship was gone. And now Adam's very nature has changed. His na now he's changed into sin. Now he's, he's a, by nature, he's a rebel. I mean, people forget this sometimes, that, that uh, un uh, born again people, their nature is rebellious. Uh, I mean, we, we think, well, sin is just a disease. Well, I'll, I don't go that far, but what's at the root of it? The root of it is rebellion. We're hateful to God. We don't like God. We, we might say all the right things, but really, the, the God we like is the one that we've made in our image. This one we... We, we don't like this one. So we're hateful, hostile towards God. The carnal mind, it says, it is enmity towards God. It, it, I mean, it sees God as the enemy. That's what it does. So that's what happened. So Adam, he's, he's out of there. So God always had a high priest in mind and a priesthood. And, and God is a covenant God. In our studies of the covenant, we've seen in a covenant there is a representative of the two parties. And, and, and you know, the representative, he represents all of the people. So whatever covenant is made between those two, all the benefactors uh, get all of that stuff. So that, that's us. So he hints at it in, in Genesis here. Uh, about this uh, priesthood, about this uh, return into the fellowship. He calls it the seed of the woman. You know, this whole thing, the, the seed of the woman. And we get little pictures of it. Uh, we don't know what it's called yet, but, you know, the scripture says Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Now, you couldn't be in the very presence of God except you be a high priest. So he's had them there just kind of tucked away in little places, you know. Noah, it says, walked with God. He found grace in the eyes of God. Noah. 
Noah was the one who sent forth the dove that brought back the olive branch. We're going to look at that here just in a few minutes, the olive branch. Can you imagine? And I just looked at this, and I was just kind of in awe. You know, the olive branch, I mean, that's, that's peace, right? Noah didn't offer peace to God. God offered peace to Noah. You know, the dove brought the olive branch to Noah. And I thought, well, my, I mean, do you see the direction here? It wasn't us saying, oh, God, no, he's offered it to us. So this high priest is ordained or appointed for the welfare of the people. And so he was set apart. And you know, when we looked at this, when that high priest was set apart with great solemnity uh, to offer both gifts to God and sacrifices for sin, you know, he was... He was anointed, beautiful garments. I mean, you know, I mean, why make such a show of this thing if this wasn't very uh, important? A lot of pageantry involved, but, but, it, but it's beautiful. And it says, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? So these uh, priests here, these high priests who are set apart, Aaron, being, being a man, uh, he's sensible of his own ignorance, his own weakness. And, and, you know, I think we see that Sunday, the sparrow. I mean, David was very sensible of his own weakness, his own inability to do Anything there he was. So this high priest, he he's 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 there, uh, sensible of his own ignorance, and so he's able to sympathize with the, with those who are ignorant. And and verse three, by reason hereof he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer sins. You know, under Aaron when he went in, he had to not only offer sacrifices for sins for the people on the Day of Atonement, but he also had to offer sacrifice for himself. He wasn't above them. And it says that no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. See, this, this, this office uh, had honor with it. The office of the high priest was the most honorable office and it was given to Aaron and then, then to his sons. And, and again, uh, with great solemnity, uh, with, with the sweet smelling oil they were anointed and the most beautiful garments and sacrificeable sacrifice was offered for them. I mean, this was... This was a big deal. It was, uh, you know, every uh, four years when the president is, comes into office. I mean, on January 20th, I mean, it's a big deal. And this was the most, and this is an office ordained of God. You know, I want you to think about it. The president was ordained to men, but this is an office ordained of God. So I just want you to keep in mind the honor that is bestowed upon this office. But the principal honor lay in the work that the priests were to perform, this high priest. And in representing the whole body of people and offering what? Gifts and sacrificing for them and blessing them. And they were all types and shadows, we know this, pointing to Christ. The whole law was sitting there pointing to Christ. And it says, no man could take this honor upon himself. There in verse 4. And what that means is, you, or uh, I, I wrote here, you couldn't intrude. You know what an intruder is? You get an intruder in your home with somebody that's not authorized to be there. They broke in. You couldn't intrude into this office because it was God ordained. It must be a call from God. As was Aaron. Do you remember we had times in scriptures where people tried to intrude into the office? Korah. 
came out one day and says, hey, why is Aaron better than us? We can do that. We can do that. And, and you know, it, it got bad on him because you don't intrude into this office. This is, this is a holy office. The earth opened up and swallowed them up. And then great witness was given that it was to Aaron and him only because they put all of the rods, they put the name on the rod and put them all in that holy place. And they came back, Aaron's rod bloomed, blossomed, brought forth almonds. To, to As a witness to all this, is, you don't intrude into this office. And I want you to think, because the ministry of Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. That's the, We're looking at the Day of Atonement. We're looking at, at, at a, a priestly office. A priestly office here. The writer of this Hebrews, I mean, we're going to see this whole thing is a priestly office. And do you remember... Uh, in in John, I mean, think about this. Now, just remember what I just said. No man takes this honor to himself. In John chapter 8 and 54, and Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. You, you, you see? I mean, we're talking a priestly office right here, and I'm not taking any honor unto myself. It's my Father that honoreth me. Now, Paul, he claimed that Jesus Christ held the, that office of the high priest. He, he, he called him our great high priest. Now, we'll get into this more a little bit later, but how could he be, Jesus be the great high priest if he came from David and the tribe of Judah because we know it was through Levi and we know it was through the sons of Aaron but we've got a really good genealogy here Matthew gives us one, Luke gives us one and we know there's no mention of Jesus coming through Levi he came through Judah So you had to be called into this office. And, you know, in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, he said, I declare the decree. Uh, and you remember that was a conversation between God the Father and God the Son. And the Lord, God, has said unto me, Jesus, the Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And that's what he's talking about here in verse 5. So Christ also glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. God exalted him into that office. And he's anointed. You know, you had to be anointed. He's what? Anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. The Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest of the whole human race. Uh, Aaron and his sons, they offered beasts. They offered the blood of bulls and goats, bullocks. But Jesus offered himself. He offered his, his own blood. And then he rose from the dead and ascended. And you know, I love that. Far above, passed through the heavens, it says. Ever uh, appearing. In the presence of God for us because he never dies. You know, these other priests, they died. But Jesus never dies, so he can never have a successor. And then it says here in verse 6, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, that goes back to Psalms 10, which we'll look at here in a few minutes. So you've got an order here, an order of, of Aaron and the high priest, but now there's another order coming on, uh, the order of Melchizedek. So we've got an order of Aaron and an order of the law, 
which now we got an order of Melchizedek, so there has to be a necessity of change in the law. And we'll see that uh, more later, but no more animal sacrifices are to be offered. No more going up to the temple. No more uh, any of that. In, in Jesus' one offering, he's done away with that whole order. In his one offering, he's done away with the whole order. Not a part of the order, the entire order. And now, how do we come into the presence of God? By a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through, through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. What is it? It's the cross. It's Jesus said, I'm the door. He said, I'm the way. I'm, I'm the truth. I'm, I'm the life. So by a new and living way. And you know, Melchizedek held two offices. He was both king and priest. And in Israel's history, you never had that. You had the kingship of David and the priesthood of Aaron. But now these two have become one in the person of Jesus Christ. And in verse 7 it says, Who are the days of his flesh? That means his incarnation when he was born here. In the days of his flesh, When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that, in that he feared. And when I look at this verse, and we're going to slow down here a little bit on, on this verse right here. Uh, I mean, when he took all the infirmities, when he... When he took all the sin, when he took all the rebellion, the feeling of our infirmities, tempted in all points as we are yet without sins. It says, when he offered up prayers and supplications. Now look how he offered them up. With strong crying and tears. And to him that was able to save him from death. And was heard in that he feared. Prayers and supplications. Prayers and supplications. What is he praying for? What are his supplications here? What is supplication? What, what is his prayer? In, in the Gospels, I, I go back and look at the Gospels. And he takes... You know, after that last supper, and, and he, he leaves that upper room, and he goes out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And he just takes Peter, James, and John with him. And he, he stops them there, and he tells these guys, watch and pray. And they go to sleep, and I, I was looking at it in, in all uh, the Gospels that how heavy his soul was. How, I mean, he uses words, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. And, the, and the, the gospel says he fell on his face. He fell on his face, prayed, oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So he's praying with strong uh, crying and tears here. Strong crying and tears. And he's, I mean, this is Jesus. This is Son of God. This is high priest, our great high priest. And he's falling on his face. His soul is exceeding sorrowful. I mean... There's a cup here, and he's praying, let this cup pass. I mean, here, the Redeemer of the world, the Redeemer of man, the, the Savior of the world, is appearing here as a man. I mean, we got to get that, as, as a man. He also, likewise, took part of the same, the Scripture says. Because he, him, and him alone must make propitiation 
for sin. I can't say atonement because the soul, atonement didn't put away sin. Atonement just covered it over. He's going to make total satisfaction for sin. How? By suffering, and he can only suffer as a man. I mean, the law has been broken. Mankind is under a curse. I want you, I want, we, we don't get this sometimes. We, we forget this sometimes, and we just, you know. I look around in this world out here, and I think, my gosh, if the wrath of God isn't abiding right now in the children of disobedience, I don't know what's going on. I mean, look at our nation. Look at the world. I mean, how many people, uh, I mean, look at the curses, and then look what's going on in our world. And I say, oh, my gosh. I mean, I, I see it. I see it. Jesus, this, this man, the Son of God, came to redeem him, to bring us out of that. And, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, Pharaoh, Moses tells him, uh, you know, they got the plague of frogs. And he says, whenever you want the frogs to leave, they'll leave. And he says, well, tomorrow. Why not now? You know, and I, I go back and I look and I say, why did the children of Israel stay so long in bondage in Egypt? 400 years. 400 years. What did they do? They didn't do nothing. They just sat there. Watch the church do today. It just sits there. It just takes it. I, I remember when we were studying on healing. And, and you know, there's no, oh, well, I got a cold. Who cares? It's just like we take it like, oh, that's just the common lot of man. It is not. It's all because of sin and our fallen state. And Jesus came to redeem us from that nonsense. But we, we, don't, we don't see it. We just take it. It's okay. We take it laying down. You know, you, uh, Jesus didn't, buddy. He, he went. He went about healing all that were oppressed. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. It's a curse out there. I want to I look at this curse a little bit. I want to go to Deuteronomy. Just I can't read it all because it's... it's Huge, but just look at a few verses. In verse 23, Deuteronomy 28, verse 23. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. I mean, this is part of the curse. The heaven over thee will be brass, and the earth under thee shall be iron. What's he talking about right there? He's talking about judgment. Whenever I hear the word brass, he's talking about judgment. And what did Jesus say? Because the verses I'm picking out for you right here, I just want to show you that Jesus took the curse. See, he that knew no sin, he bore the curse. He took this curse on him. And when Jesus says, for judgment am I come into the world. And so he took it so the heavens over him were brass. And the earth under thee it shall be as iron. And verse 24, the Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and the dust from heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. And what is it? What did Jesus cry from the cross? I thirst. I thirst. His tongue cleaved to his mouth. I mean, in Psalm 22, I thirst. I mean, he's bearing the curse. The curse that we say it's okay to live under today. This thing that was so costly to Jesus, you'll see here in a minute, that, that cost, uh, the, I mean, it's not just the blood of Jesus. It's the precious blood of Jesus. And we, we trample it under feet. I mean, there's a warning in the book of Hebrews about us trampling it under foot again. That means, this means we just don't take this seriously. We'll get over there when we look at it. I'm not talking about salvation, but, but to me, I'm looking, I, I, I want to ring a bell. You know, I was, I was looking at an old church today, and, I, and, and, and the church uh, had a big old steeple. And, you know, it's an old steeple. The church is kind of redone, but it still had the old steeple up in it. And I said, why was that? Why did they have that? Well, in the, in the days, they rang that bell. And that means, you know, that it's, it's time for us to get together. And the gospel is the great ringing of the bell. It's time to wake up, old sleepers. It's time to wake up. I'm ringing the bell. The gospel is ringing the bell. Wake up, old sleepers. Verse 26. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and to the beast of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. I mean, Jesus is on the cross, and what's he doing? He's being mocked. 
Oh, if you're the son of God, get yourself down. Oh, look at him now, son of David. I mean, what's he doing? Got a, a thing over his head. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. He was mocked. Verse 29, and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind groveth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt uh, be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Nobody came to his rescue. He died on that cross. And I'm going to tell you, the scripture says from the sixth hour on, which would have been noon, darkness. And it says you'll grope. As the noonday and the darkness. It's supposed to be the brightest time of day, the noonday, and darkness covered the earth. Verse 30 Thou shalt betroth a, uh, betroth a wife, another man shall lie with her, and thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein, and thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shall not gather the grapes that are up. This is part of the curse. In other words, he's talking great betrayal here. I look around in our nation, man, and our, your own nation betrays you. Betrayal is everywhere. It's common. You know, I, I, I was raised up a man's only as uh, good as his word. And what does that mean today? I can't trust you. We need a contract. And we need lawyers involved because it ain't no good anymore. Betray that's, that's the curse. I mean, when I look at, uh, you know, what they call the swamp, that's the curse. Verse 32, thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto, unto other people. Thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them uh, all the day long. And there shall be no might in thine hand. I mean, I look around and my gosh. I mean, just looking at the, at the curse. I mean, Jesus was crucified in front of his own mother. And how many times do we just witness things with our own family? And what do you do? You feel helpless. You feel helpless. Verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not into the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. Jesus bore all of that in himself. He alone. All of that. Deuteronomy. All of those curses. He took them into himself. Now here he is in this garden of Gethsemane, offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. What's he talking about? I mean, our high priest here, our great high priest, Jesus, Son of God, he's about to be made sin here. He's about to partake of the cup and bear this whole thing. Now I want you to get this picture. He's he hasn't, take, he hasn't been made sin yet. He's in the garden. And this is where it's about to take place. This cup is going to be presented to him. He'll have to voluntarily take of that cup. He's about to be made sin. Take on himself the full weight of the curse we were reading about. And the end result of that is death. All this cup. I mean, this cup, I mean, we can't even imagine, but I mean, to think about it, Jesus, the, the Son of God, the one who said, peace be still. And the wind ceased. And the disciples were amazed. Is praying with, and making supplications with strong cry and tears. What was the supplications he offered? Unto him that was able to Save him from death. We got to we got to look just a little bit right here. This the sphere of death uh, that uh, in in Christ here is way different from what's in man, what's in us. Why does man fear death? Well, because of what lies beyond the grave, because of judgment, man sin, and we don't want to face that. And we know we know we we that death is because man sinned, right? They're afraid to meet their judge. And you know, I told you, it's either a throne of grace or a throne of judgment. 
We're talking to Hebrews right now. They knew God was up there. And, and what did the Hebrews know God as? They knew him as judge. But see, Jesus can have no fear on these grounds. Why? Because he was without sin. So that means he is now suffering for me. As my great high priest and for you and all that here. He's suffering for us as man as our what? Propitiation. Now, we can't possibly conceive how great the suffering that he went through was. I mean, we, it would be foolish for our little minds to conceive, uh, try to, the Son of Man suffering here. I mean, he's so much in pain, so much suffering, uh, being in agony, his sweat became great drops of blood. An angel... Uh, from heaven is sent to strengthen him. And he prayed more earnestly. What did he pray? What was his prayer? I've got to know what this prayer was. Right? I've got to know. What did Jesus pray here? Now death was, was the portion of man. And all feared. We read that in Hebrews 2. Uh, verse 14. All feared. And all were in bondage. Held in bondage. Held captive to death. Now, Christ is going to destroy death. Destroy. You know, what, you know what it means to destroy? You know, sometimes they, they work at the bank. They just don't throw papers away. They shred them. You know what I mean? They shred them. Destroy. Now, the tortures, the torments uh, necessary to affect this destruction, Jesus alone could feel. What's he facing it with? Strong crying and tears. He prayed and offered supplication. And, and it says, and he was heard in that he feared. In other words, it, it means his prayer was answered in, 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 that he, in that he feared. His prayers as our mediator were answered. His sufferings and death were complete and, and effectual as our sacrifice. Now, I want you to get this. Jesus, what's he doing here? He's coming. Now, I mean, we are told to come boldly to the throne of grace. That doesn't mix with, with strong crying and tears, right? I mean, it, I mean, there may be tears involved in prayer, and that's, and that's okay. But we can boldly, with, with full rights, come to the throne. Now, here's Jesus, but Jesus isn't coming here to the throne of grace. He's coming to the throne of judgment. With prayers and supplication and strong crying and, uh, uh, and tears unto him that was able to save him from, de from death. Now, in, you know, the Jews have a lot of teaching, uh, you know, rabbis reading in, in the Talmud and, and some of the other things. And, and one of the rabbis says there's three degrees of prayer, each surpassing the other, the other in sublimity, and, and, and that is prayer. And it, that, that is crying and tears. And it says prayer is made in, in silence. And crying is made with loud voice, but tears surpass all. Well, right here we see if, if that's true, Christ made all, uh, every aspect of this prayer. So this word uh, that, that got me was this word supplication. Now, when you look it up in, in uh, the concordance, it means asking, it, it means approaching for a favor. Okay? And the word here is used in no other place in the New Testament. Sometimes it might, they might say supplications, but it's not this word. Now, this word here is the word uh, hikiteria. I know I'm not pronouncing that right. But listen to what this word is. Now get this picture. Jesus, as our high priest, he's making prayers to God, the judge of the world. Now is the judgment of this world. And he's making supplication here. He's coming uh, to God the Father. Now this word supplication here means a branch of olive. 
that is rolled around with wool. Now think on that. And what the Greeks would do, and this has been throughout history, the uh, people there to make supplication, when, when they went to plead with the government, they would go out and get olive branches and wrap them in wool and come and prostrate uh, down on the ground before the king or the emperor or the rulers and offer them the olive branches wrapped in wool here. So, so here... Uh, I mean, when, when they came, it, it, it's uh, uh, he who in the most humble and servile manner entreats and begs anything from another. It's, it's, it's called the branches of supplication, olive branches. And it, it could be waved by somebody making supplication, seeking peace. What do we do today that, that's similar to that? Hey, I'm in a fight. I, I take a stick and I take a white handkerchief and put on the stick and I raise it up. I surrender. I surrender. What does Jesus pray out there? Not my will. I surrender. But thy will be done. Now he's doing this. Now think on this. He's doing this on our behalf. So uh, you know what's taking place right here? Because this is covenant. So what is taking place right here is, it's as if the whole human race in the person of Jesus is saying, Father, I give up. I'm, I'm not against you anymore. I surrender. Do, I mean, can you see this? I surrender. That's the supplication here. There must be surrender. I mean, Paul said, I, I suffered the loss of all things. You know what Paul did on the road to Damascus? He surrendered. He gave up. I think there, there has to be a time in a Christian's life when you give up, when you surrender. Not my will, but thine be done. There's a prayer that, that Daniel prayed. Let me, let me read that uh, prayer. Daniel chapter 9, verse, start verse 16. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of for our sins and the iniquities of, of our fathers. Jerusalem and the people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Can you see he's praying here? Lord, your anger, your wrath is upon us. I'm raising the white flag, Daniel said. Look at us. I, I look at the church and I say, look at us. Look at us. The people look at us. The world looks at us and they say, who are y'all? Y'all are nothing. We're not scared of y'all. We, we're going to take your prayer out of school. We're not going to listen to y'all. Nothing. We don't, we don't care what y'all do. Y'all are a bunch of crazy Christians. We're a reproach to the world. That's what Daniel is seeing right here. That's where we are right now. And he says, Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Not for mine, for the Lord's sake. Now, now this prayer, he's reaching all the way forward into this very night of Gethsemane right here. For the Lord's sake. Oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations. And the city which is called by thy name, your name, Father. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness. I'm bringing the white branches, the olive branches rest, wrapped in wool. Not because I'm so righteous and deserve this, but for your mercies. What is that? That word has said for your covenant. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. Oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. What a prayer. What a prayer. Jesus Christ, the representative of and, and delegate from the, for the whole human race, who, who 
I mean, this whole human race who was oppressed, who was in bondage, slaves to sin, in darkness, in ignorance, rebels. Jesus, the righteous branch, the scripture calls him. Now you know why he, I mean, that, that word is supplication. He himself is going to be offered. Jesus, the righteous branch, the olive branch wrapped in wool, the ensign of a most distressed uh, supplicant, presents himself before the throne of God, God with strong crying and tears and praise against death. Who is he praying against death for? On behalf of those he represented. Who did he represent? You and me. And it says he was heard and that he, he feared. The, the evils were removed. The oppressor was cast down. Satan was bound. Satan has been spoiled of his dominion and reserved in chains of darkness against the judgment of that great day. Now listen, what's he talking about? It says right here too that he was able to save him from death. Who's he talking about? Him here is a pronoun. Y'all know what a pronoun is. We got to stay in context here, right? He wasn't praying, save me from death. I'm offering on behalf of them. I'm offering, Lord, if you'll receive this offering, let them live. Can you see what he's saying here? Let them live. They're in bondage of death. So he's implying here with this word him, the collective body of all that he represents. The children who were partakers of flesh and blood, just like he was, who through fear of death were what, all their lifetime subject to bondage. Them that were subject to bondage, that's, that's the him here. So he, Jesus, made supplication with strong crying and tears to him who is the Father, who was able to save them, us, from death. Did, can you see that? The them of Hebrews 2.15 is the him in this verse. So let me paraphrase this verse. Jesus Christ, in the days of his flesh, for he was incarnated to redeem man who had fallen into sin and in his propitiation offering when representing all mankind offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears to him who was able to save them us from death the intercession prevailed the passion and the sacrifice were accepted. The sting of death removed. Satan cast down from his throne in that he feared. And you know, when Jesus came back from that prayer, he was ready to go. You know, he came back and they were sleeping and he rebuked them and he came back again. And the next time he said, sleep on. And then here they come. He said, wait, I'm ready to go. Because why? I, you know, when I read that and I looked at that, who, who endured the sufferings and these cross? Why? For the joy that was set before him. I mean, his prayer, can you imagine? I mean, he talked to, to, to God, his Father, on behalf of us. If you'll receive this offering, let them go. And the Father said, you got it. I will treat them as I treat you. And with the righteousness, I'll set them, I'll do uh, for them what I do for you. Oh my gosh. I mean, can you see this beauty here? In verse 8 here, i got to hurry. Though he were a son, yet he learned, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Uh, he did not have to go learn uh, obedience like he was ignorant of it. He had to figure it out. Uh, he wasn't absence of obedience. He had an experience of it. He did it voluntarily he did it on our behalf and his obedience is both the rule and measure of our righteousness before God he he learned it experientially I mean we could we could go back to Philippians I won't for time's sake and, and read Philippians chapter 2 5 through 8 and verse 9 being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation and to them that obey being made perfect, being made a complete Savior, suited in all aspects to redeem people. I mean, what complete, finished, 
perfect. Suffering was necessary to the completeness uh, of his character as Savior. I mean, it, it says that in Hebrews 2.10, For it became him whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Why? So that he would know exactly what you're going through. He feels it. He's been there. He became the author, the procuring cause, the author of eternal salvation and all that obey him. What's, you know, we throw it, that's like a disqualifier, but what, what's the whole book of Hebrews about? I mean, they had an evil heart of unbelief. They were disobedient. They said, no, God, we're not going into the wilderness. So all who obey him, what is it? We, we believe him. This, we hold fast our profession that Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation to us. He's our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's offered himself, and God is satisfied through that one offer that he offered with, with strong crying and tears, and it was, it was accepted, and God has propitiated. Now, do you believe that? If so... Salvation by grace through faith. You, you see that? Called of God, in verse, in, in verse 10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now this word call is different. It's not, uh, it's not appointed as Aaron was, but this word is addressed. It, it, it means to salute. It means I'm honoring you in that position. That's what, what we learn how to salute. We salute, we salute uh, the higher rank, so we salute. So God is saluting Jesus. Do, do you see that call of God? God addressed him as high priest. I mean, get a hold of that. Uh, and, and that comes right out. Uh, of Psalm 110. Let me let me go show you there. Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. God the Father invited God the Son to sit down at his right. There's an invitation here. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God invited his son in human nature to sit at his right hand as governor of the world. And he's foretelling here of the blessed fruits of his government. And then it says he published the oath. Back here in Psalm 110, he published the oath which made him what? A priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He did this all the way back in Psalms. Before he even sent Jesus into the world to accomplish the salvation of mankind. And he declared that he would not repent of that oath. And in Philippians 2, 9 says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, a name above every name. And, what is, and what's the scripture says? Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Then it says in verse 11, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to, and, and hard to be uttered, senior, dull of hearing, many things to say. I'd like to talk to you about Melchizedek and Christ and the endless priesthood, Jesus, Son of God, but you're dull of hearing. In other words, what he's saying here is you haven't kept up with the doctrines and, and the exhortations that's been delivered to you. It's like, you know, you're called to a race. Paul says we, we're running a race and the road is laid out before you plain, how to proceed and the blessings to be obtained, but you've made no effort to move on. You're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge, to full knowledge of the truth. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. They'd heard the gospel for many years. Professed to be Christians for a long time. They ought to be teachers. Every Christian ought to be a teacher. 
But he says you need to be taught a second time. You need to be taught over. Certain elements of the doctrine of, of, of Christ. They had once been uh, better instructed, but now they forgot the teaching. The epistle here is written to keep them from backsliding. You say, well, you don't like to turn. Well, backsliding here, they want to go back to the law. And he says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Milk, I'm just going to say, was, was the doctrines of the law, which were only the rudiments of religion, were intended to lead us to Christ, that we might be what? Justified by faith. And they're not skillful in the word of righteousness or in the doctrine of justification, which does what? Requires faith, requires belief in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. As what? Our great high priest. But strong meat belonging to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Strong meat. What is that? The propitiation. People don't get that today. They don't think God has been satisfied in the one offering. Propitiation. How about justification by faith? How about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? How about the fullness of Christ dwelling in you? How about victory over death? How about the resurrection of the body? Endless union with Christ Jesus in His throne of glory. How about sons of God? Strong me. By reason of use, what is that? Constant hearing, constant believing, uh, praying. Using all the graces of God's Spirit. And, and in the faithful use of them, find everyone improved so that you daily grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he says senses exercise, you know this. He's not talking natural senses. He's talking about your soul senses. Taste and see the Lord is good. Except you eat my flesh. He wasn't talking about natural stuff there. These soul senses are by the means where the soul is made comfortable, where the soul rests. You can have, there is a rest unto your what? Souls. Which it derives its joy and perfection. And exercise here is a metaphor taken from the Grecian games where they would go out and, and, and uh, I'll just say this, they practice all their powers and skills and agility so that they would be better prepared when the real tournament began. So they, they practiced. And what was... What was the use of all of it? So that uh, they would be able to discern good and evil. So that they wouldn't fall for the false doctrine and subtleties of, sa of Satan. So they could make proper use of the grace already given them by God. On behalf of Jesus' finished work. So anyway, I'll quit with that and we'll continue on next week so we'll stop that's chapter five <laughs>